Uh, but before we begin, you know, yeah, space bar doesn't work. Okay, hold on. There we go. Okay, before I begin this, the presentation proper, I just want to make a disclaimer that when you're talking talking about virtual re virtual reality, is a lot like dancing about architecture. It's uh, if you haven't experienced it for yourself, it is kind of hard to describe uh, in, in, in words in a lot of ways. So a lot, a lot of what I say, you got to really, you really have to have experienced it before you, uh, before you kind of know it. Because the, the whole point of virtual reality is that you feel like you really are there. If you're standing on a wooden plank that's several stories high, like, uh, like, like dozens of stories high in the sky, you might literally be just standing on the carpet of your living room. But when you put the uh, VR goggles on, it's so convincing that you really are that high up. You're going to get motion sickness. You're going to, you know, you're, 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 you're going to feel it. So, uh, so, you know, it's, that's, that, that's the whole point here. And, you know, there, there, I don't know if there's much doubt that this is useful for video games anymore. I mean, there's still naysayers on that, but what about education? Um, there are, the, 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 I was looking for good examples of hype uh, for virtual reality uh, in education. And uh, there was a lot more in the 90s than there is now, but we, but we do have naysayers claiming that it's overhyped. I guess that means something. We had the, uh, uh, this Forbes article, which, uh, which claim, which you know, makes some good sounding arguments that digital learning uh, uh, isn't new anymore because a lot of people are using VR for that. Yeah, okay, that, that's fine. The campus experience still matters. I don't think anybody doubts that. And VR doesn't solve any fundamental problems uh, for its expense. Well, that might actually be true also, but that doesn't mean it can't be useful in some important way. And then this Inside Higher Education article also, uh, aside from this quote here saying that, you know, we'll look back on VR without and it having no advantage. They also say, like, you know, they also point out the value of education uh, uh, that people will pay for is where the educator can get to know a learner as an individual. You know, that's kind of a separate point. There's, there's a lot of tools uh, uh, one can use for education. Not all of them necessarily need to interact with with the with teachers and students that you've all you a lot of you may have seen this hype cycle before this is sort of the general pattern new technologies go through uh you know where they everyone thinks that this new technology will solve everything and then and it doesn't but then people find out a new use for it like when radiation was like nuclear power is going to like solve all of our power problems and then it doesn't but now we're you know, figure out how to use it. And gen uh, genetics, you know, will solve all of our problems and it doesn't, but then we figure out good ways to use it. So in, th in this presentation, I want to, at Elf, so where are we on, with virtual reality right now on this hype cycle? We might be someplace around this spot. I, it's hard to tell because the, the adoption base is kind of low, but you know, we're probably not at the plateau of productivity quite yet, but, but uh, why I want to explore what would that look like? What are the factors that would uh, put a virtual reality on the plateau of productivity as a uh, learning tool. And I've, I've looked at a variety of different articles from a variety of different places, making a whole bunch of different claims, and I've decided to categorize, and this is kind of opinionated-ish, but, uh, but we'll, 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 we'll get to some, some of the science and some of the strong points later, uh, sort of categorizing them on points that are kind of weak, kind of eh, and kind of strong. The weak ones are weak because we already have good tools to do this. A realistic simulation in virtual reality might be more realistic, but is it really that much more advantageous? It may, maybe not. We already have plenty of multi-user experiences without VR systems. So what VR brings to the table is, is good and fun and all, but it's, it's kind of weak when, uh, for education. And same thing with distance learning, you know, and, uh, and the fact that it's fun. A lot of people point out virtual reality is going to change education because it's fun. Well, guess what? A lot of things are fun. A lot of things make education fun. Not all of them get to stick around for very long. All right. Uh, so that's why I put fun on the weekend, even though I happen to think VR is very is, is a lot of fun. I almost put it on the maybe list. But yeah. Anyway, for for the maybes, these are things where virtual reality might excel. Uh, a little bit, but but might not be able to uh, might not still make it put it 
over the top as something uh, worthwhile. The, the fact that it's a novel experience, the novelty of being in virtual reality right now makes anything you do in it going to be that much more memorable. That might be true today, but as the novelty wears off, it won't be true for very long. Okay, there's this talk about assistance in for, for folks with disabilities. And that is a topic that could be a presentation all on its own. But, uh, and there, there, there's some merit here. The fact that there's just a couple of points here. Uh, it can help some folks overcome physical limitations. It creates some safe spaces and risk-free experiences for folks. And it can eliminate distractions are among the reasons why virtual reality might be good for folks with disabilities. But we also have other tools for that. I don't know if VR is necessarily going to, uh, is going to be that much better for things like this. And then there's uh, using virtual reality simply to rehearse something like public speaking. Uh, uh, you know, th th there might be some merit to that. But again, there's, there's it's, I, I've, I've had a public speak, I've, I've been through a public rehe um, speaking rehearsal system in virtual reality and whether it worked or not you will let me know after this presentation <laughs> uh i think uh i, I think it, it, it it's great but you know it's 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 not necessarily going to be mind-blowing but what are the mind-blowing things what are the strong things that virtual reality brings to the market that nothing else can that's the key there are no substitutes for virtual reality when it comes to certain things and uh, the, the first one I will go over, probably the most important one, is something called the empathy, ma empathy machine or empathy agent, depending on who you talk to. The, uh, the impressive aspects of almost being, the, being there uh, brings a lot of value to certain experiences. And the fact that we can explore impossible concepts. Uh, yeah, so all, all of these, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, so all, all these become weak, weak and maybe because you have to weigh them against the issues that people take up with virtual reality. The fact that it's not for everyone. Some people get motion sickness easily. Uh, some people literally can't use it because they're blind or can't move their heads. Okay. Um, some people took, uh, some people talk about the expense of it. Yeah, virtual reality in its current state is going to be very expensive. Um, I should mention cheap virtual reality does kind of exist. There are these uh, Google VR, uh, Google Cardboard uh, uh, things have existed for a long time. The problem is nobody really wants them. They're a bit clunky to use. They're not the same as a good VR equipment. And the fact that and they are cheap if you happen to already have a cell phone. If you, because you have to put your cell phone in here for it to work. If you don't have a cell phone, then this is actually expensive because you got to get a cell phone first. Uh, so, uh, uh, but the cost will go down, you know, as, as they usually do. And some people also complain that there's not enough content in VR right now. And I crossed that one off the list because that is rubbish. That there is plenty of content for virtual reality right now. I can do a whole hour long presentation on just that point, but I gotta, I, I, I gotta, uh, I gotta keep things in scope here. Uh, I should mention that, yeah, okay, I called this that things weak, but that doesn't mean it doesn't bring something to the table. So er, earlier in the year, I attended Virtual Burning Man uh, in 2020 in, in, vir, in virtual reality. Ho, ho, uh, there were actually several different versions of Burning Man running at the same time, and one of them was hosted on something called Alt Space VR. So yeah, so you're in an environment where you can talk to people. There's a lot of fun in doing that, and it's, it's really cool and all, although you don't necessarily need a virtual reality helmet to use this. You could chat with people in these environments without the helmet. It's just not quite as cool. Uh, so what do I, so I talked about the empathy machine earlier. So what do I mean by that? I, this, so I, I'm ordering these things if I make most important to least important. The most important one and uh, the most important point to make is that vir virtual reality can change how we think about others. Okay, the theory here is that doing stuff changes behavior more effectively than merely seeing and hearing stuff. Okay, so there's a particular experiment from Stanford University led by this fellow named Jerry Balenson. He has a nice TED talk on this. And I, I, um, and so it basically goes like this. He, he wanted to see if he can use virtual reality to reduce the amount of paper people use in, in their lives. So he had three groups of people. 
One group watched videos of someone cutting down trees. And another group read a beautifully written narrative about what it's like to cut down a tree. And the third group actually physically cut down trees in a virtual reality environment. And this wasn't just, this wasn't just a visual environment. They had uh, a chainsaw type of device that provided haptic feedback. It, it, it vibrated in their hands. So as they're hitting the trunk of the tree, they really feel it in their arms as it goes through, okay? So after these three experiences, all three groups said that they will pledge to to use uh, much less paper. However, when they were evaluated afterwards, only one of those three groups actually did consistently use a lot less paper, and that was the virtual reality group. They used 20% uh, reduction in paper use. At least that's what Jeremy Bailson is claiming. Um, and as a skeptic, I would like to see this type of uh, experiment replicated a bit more often. But that is, but but that is kind of the, the general thing we're hoping for for virtual reality to be uh, of value. Doing stuff in virtual reality changes how changes your behavior more effectively than anything else. And there's some other examples of this. There is an autism simulator that you can download that shows you what it's like to be someone with autism. Uh, what what happens is. Uh, Different, different things start happening. I don't have video for any of this. It would be nice if I did, but I kind of kept my pledge not to use video in this presentation. Uh, some of these decorations on the walls will start uh, spinning around and then colors will start to oversaturate. You become, your, your senses become oversaturated, uh, uh, overstimulated as if you have uh, 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 autism. And so fo uh, folks who go through this will, treat folks with autism substantially differently than they did before. Even parents of children with autism, they think they know, they, they understand their children before they go through this autism simulator. They understand them even more afterwards and they, and they, they, they treat them even more uh, uh, especially well after going through this type of thing. And then there's the uh, oh, virtual Ishika is uh, Ishika. Is, uh, I, well, let's see. There's there's a lot we could say about this one, but it is basically an island off of Italy. Uh, the short version of the story is is that there are coral reefs down there, uh, some of which are being affected by uh, air by vents in the ocean floor that are acidifying the ocean floor and and sort of ruining the uh, coral reefs. And the idea is that People who, in real life, who've scuba dived in this area will feel much more inclined to preserve the environment and to take climate change much more seriously. Because if climate change is doing the same acidification to coral reefs, you know, it's, it's hard. It, it, when, when you just watch a documentary about scuba diving, it's hard to appreciate it as much as someone who's actually been down there and seen the evidence for themselves. Virtual Ishika aimed to uh, bring as close as possible a real experience so that they can appreciate what goes down there in a much more visceral manner and hopefully change their behavior uh, afterwards. And one of the more interesting quirky examples I like to give is about what it's like to be blind or sightless. So what does that mean in virtual reality? Does that mean you put a virtual reality uh, headset on your face and you don't see anything, it's just dark. I mean, why don't you just put a blindfold on with headphones? What's the difference here? Actually, both of these, both of these products I'm highlighting, uh, they do things with visuals to represent where sound is located. So when you hear something, there's, there's a visual effect that takes place. That it, it represents what's going on in the mind of someone who's blind. They don't literally see those uh, th those, uh, sound, th those sound waves, but they're able to map in their mind what the sound waves look like. And so Notes on Blindness is based on a series of recordings. It was also a novel, uh, not a novel, a, 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 a nonfiction book on someone who, uh, who, who talked about his experience about going blind and it was converted into this virtual reality uh, thing. And then this, this was actually the, my, this is one of the first uh, VR experiences I had, like way back when I had this little uh, gear VR thing, which is kind of outdated by today. 
understand it. Even before I learned what the empath words empathy machine meant, uh, I said, you know, this can change. The, if, if you can understand better how someone feels when they're blind, this can change virtual reality. This, this, this brings meaning to what virtual reality can do. Okay, but this notes on blindness is not very interactive. It's more of a uh, more of a walkthrough on what it's like to be blind. Uh, this video game, on the other hand, blind is actually not intended to be educational. Uh, th this blind uh, is a, this game is a psychological thriller where you are kidnapped by somebody and you lose your sight and you have to bang a, a cane on different sur object surfaces to solve different puzzles to get the hell out of there. And so even though it's not intended to be educational, people who go through this video game will appreciate what it's like to be blind a lot more effectively, a lot more efficiently, uh, effectively than, than, any, than, than, than any other experience. So those are some, just some examples of how virtual reality can be a, an empathy machine. There are a few other points to get through. A little bit less uh, important, but still noteworthy, are the impressive aspects of immersion. Then uh, this refers, mostly to inanimate objects in virtual reality. The spatial and temporal appreciation acquired through virtually being there. Okay, now granted, it's not as good as actually being there, but, but not everyone gets to go there. Not everyone gets to uh, go scuba diving. Not everyone gets to visit Machu Picchu. So I, last year, I, um, I actually did get to visit Machu Picchu myself. This is a photo I took of the Temple of Three Windows. Uh, before I did that, many, many months before I did that, I went through a virtual reality tour of, of the same temple, of, of the same room. And uh, so, uh, so, the, so, a pre, so if you just look at this picture of the temple, you can probably appreciate to a certain degree, but when you put the God, when you put the headset on and you're really quote unquote really almost there, you're like, wow, this you know, it, it, it's even more impressive. You you appreciate what how this thing was built to to an even much more visceral degree than you would otherwise. And I I can attest that it's not quite as good as being there because when I was there, it was even more amazing. Like I, but I said before, no one, not everyone gets to visit Machu Picchu. So VR presence is still much more impressive than anything before. It, it's not as impressive as being there, but it beats the hell out of photos, movies, 3D model tours on a flat screen, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so there's another uh, reason why virtual reality brings uh, value to education. There are some other applications that, that do this well. You can run Google Earth on your desktop PC, but when you, when you use it in virtual reality, it's even more impressive. Seeing the size and scale of everything in your face, like you know, the actual uh, 3D buildings or structures or whatever around you is a very different experience than seeing the 3D models on a flat screen. Uh, yeah, Everest VR, actually Everest VR, yeah, uh, uh, say, you, know, you get the idea. Um, I have not been to Egypt yet, but I have toured the Great Pyramid, the inside of the Great Pyramid through virtual reality. And when you do that, it's, it's really spooky, really eerie. It, it, it's, it's, you, you feel a greater appreciation for what was built there than merely watching a documentary. Of, of the Great Pyramid or anything like that. It's again, this isn't this isn't necessarily changing your behavior, but it's so much. It, it's more about learning uh, more about about what the pyramids are like when uh, when you actually go there. Uh, when you actually go there, it's it, it's just much more impressive seeing it almost in real life. And hopefully, I'll I'll visit the real pyramids someday and, and report back on the difference there. I do have some friends who've been to Egypt. Actually, they went to Las Vegas for like the Amazing Meeting and some other conventions first, and they saw the Great Sphinx in front of the Luxor. Okay, it, it's a pretty big uh, thing, and then they go to Egypt in real life. And it turns out, here's a fun fact for you: the Great Sphinx in Egypt, the real one, is actually smaller than the Great Sphinx in, the, in, in Las Vegas. So when, when these folks went from Vegas and they maybe several months later to Egypt, like that's it, that's the Great Sphinx? That, that's, that, that's not, that's, it looked a lot smaller to them than they were expecting. Um, 
So I have not found a virtual reality version of the Great Sphinx yet. Google Earth doesn't have it, and Great Pyramid VR I just showed you doesn't have the Great Sphinx in 3D e yet either. But you, you, but you get the idea. Be, having an impression of size can really uh, uh, effectively educate you on uh, certain things. Uh, and then there's another aspect of virtual reality that unfortunately goes rather underappreciated right now. Uh, perhaps, uh, and it's also very difficult to describe and therefore also might not be considered as important as the other two points I wanted to make, but I wanted to make this point anyway because it's kind of, because, because I happen to like it. Uh, you can explore impossible things, things that are impossible to do in 3D space, you can do in virtual reality. So I'm going to post this link later uh, if you'd like to watch it, this is uh, by this. This is a uh, Matt Parker, the uh, mathematic, the um, the stand-up maths guy on YouTube. Some of you may have seen him uh, uh, around. If not, uh, you know, uh, you might know him. And that, uh, he's along here with researcher Madeline Shepard. Okay, she built this hyperbolic space simulator. The idea here is that there's six, does that, okay, is, again, this is difficult to describe, okay, but there's six cubes of space surrounding each edge of this room. So basically, if you were to walk around a column in 3D space, like if, if, if this was normal, oh, let me move a point here. If this was normal 3D space, you'd start with this dark green column, move into the blue, and then after you're done with the blue, you'd walk into this, what is it, yellow, light green? Uh, I'm, I'm slightly colorblind, but uh, into this lighter uh, green space, and you just walk around like that, no problem. And in, in on the carpet of this room, that's basically what Matt was doing. He's walking around in circles. But in his VR goggles, he was experiencing something very different. When he walked into this room, a white room, a white room, the same thing would blow up it, 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 um, into his view, would come into his view, and then another color, and then another color active after that. So you'd, you'd walk around this column multiple times in order to get back to the, to the space you started from. So you're exploring something that's completely impossible to do in normal 3D space through virtual reality. And, uh, you know, I, that's, that's something VR brings to the table that nothing else can. So, uh, so the probable outcome of all these naysayers is that, okay, yeah, virtual reality will not replace most learning tools that have already been replaced by computers in general, but it will supplement them instead and in important ways. Those ways being as an empathy machine uh, for making an impression of size and historic context. I, I forgot to mention, one of the other things you can do in VR is take a historic artifact and bring it back and make it look um, put it in an environment where it's brand new, take an ancient ruin, reconstruct it so it's brand new, put it in the room as if it's brand new, and you have a greater appreciation of what that historic uh, artifact was like in the context that it originally existed. I kind of forgot to mention that before, but, but that's the idea, making an impression of size and historic context, Be, and also for exploring otherwise impossible things, at least I hope. And everything else is just bonus material. The fact that it's fun, bonus material. Distance learning, bonus material. You know. So uh, in conclusion, virtual reality is also fun and everyone should try it. Okay, so uh, that's my slide presentation. And I will uh, stop sharing. And I will now take questions. Oh, oh yeah, okay, yeah, I got my participants thing up here. And if anyone would like to ask a question, you may uh, proceed. R raise your hand on the, uh, there's a participant section where you can raise your hand. Okay, Adrian Hill. Adrian Hill? I still can't hear you, hold on. You're still- I think I was unmuted and then muted again. Okay. So can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Oh, perfect. Yeah, no, I just, uh, had, it was interesting. I, I've never tried virtual re reality, but to see some of the possible applications, it's really interesting. And my kids had OCD and a lot of phobias. So I'm wondering if this is something that could be used like an exposure and response that they had to do in reality, but maybe it would be easier if they knew it wasn't really there, that it was in virtual re reality mm -hmm. first. Did you come across anything like that? Uh, OCD, not in particular. Phobias, yes. Uh, uh, the uh, Planck, the, 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 there's something called Ritchie's Planck length, which I actually showed a screenshot of earlier, where you, the, 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 the whole, uh, well, 
The, the basic point of the game is that you go up an elevator and you walk out of a building and there's a plank of wood that's many stories up in the sky and, and you can walk down on that wood and you, and the, you really feel like you are uh, very high up. That could, uh, I, I like to tell people, if you have a fear of heights, this program could probably help you get out of it. If you don't have a fear of heights, this program might actually give it to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, for fear of spiders or fear of whatever. Yeah, there, there's a video of the SGU group, the, the Skeptic's Guide to Universe, that is, um, not, not Stargate, but it's the Skeptic's Guide, Skeptic's Guide to Universe, where they were trying Richie's plank length for the first time. And you see the reactions of their face. The elevator opens and you're like, <laughs> <laughs> Type, types of things. Uh, there's other videos too besides that. Um, but yeah, uh, fear of other things too, like fear of spiders uh, was one example I've seen also. You can be surrounded by virtual spiders to the point where you kind of acclimate to them and aren't so fearful of them anymore. Okay, next question. Uh, Jackie Parker. Yes, hi. Um, I'm wondering whether virtual reality can cause false memories. I'm thinking about, um, I, I, I visited Paris like 10 times in my life. And then I did this virtual thing that was in Paris. And then I felt that I had to make, make myself remember that that was VR and not real, or otherwise I would incorporate it into my memories. Curious what you have to think I, about that. I can foresee that being a potential issue. I haven't seen a lot of research on that particular point, but I get the point you're saying. I know that one, when we're thinking about virtual reality for me, is in, a, in a related sense is that it kind of, it messes with your dreams sometimes. Uh, the, the, the compelling nature of virtual reality is so compelling that yeah, you, you, some part of your memory and some part of your, your brain might forget what was real and what was virtual, especially after time goes on. And I know that, like, um, uh, uh, I, I know that uh, in, 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 in my dreams, I've felt that certain things were, that I had in virtual reality, I was, uh, I was kind of in. If, and, and, and then sort of remembering that, that it may have happened to me. Uh, at, like, but it was, it was really just the dream of a virtual reality kind of exhibit. You, I kind of figure, you kind of figure it out eventually in, in your brain. Uh, it, it, so it wasn't a true false memory, but, but I can see that being a potential point uh, there. Okay, oh, and we have Rob Palmer raising his hand in front of the camera. Yeah, not virtually, really. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to expand on what you said. I mean, they, they have done tests on people where they tell them certain things or show them photographs. And a huge percent of those, I think it was something like 40, 50%, actually are able to form false memories of their childhood just from that. So I can't imagine virtual reality not doing that even better. Mm. Ah, yeah, all right. Okay, any, other, any further questions? Uh, I'm not seeing it. Oh, oh, okay. I'm not seeing any further questions from anybody. If if I'm wrong about that, unmute yourself and speak now. Um, hi. Oh, hello. <laughs> okay. It's just an exact point that I probably could make too. That um, it's uh, if they start to use it, for example, on in prisons. You see, for example, I know that in a long, long ago, maybe more than 10 years ago, I went to the lecture at NYU, where a woman, I could probably find the link, um, talked about that uh, um, they, in military, they build the whole um, cities to train soldiers and train them as uh, they are in games mm -hmm. and they also in the, so to make this impression when they are in real situation that it's a game and there is a lot of controversy around it but they get away with it because they say that it's less post-traumatic stress disorder that people kind of get healthier of these situations but still you see so it's of course every technology could be used for good it could be used for bad 
and uh, it's it, not even technology anything could be used for good and for bad and um so so but here it's when someone really controls it and probably with false memories probably you could put something in this virtual reality that enforce your memory also you see and somehow so it's it's really serious question how it interact with our psychology mm -hmm. i think so yeah uh, yeah, well, it's that that is that that would be a good presentation for me maybe to tackle at a future uh, for, for, for a future presentation, the effects of virtual reality on psychology, just in general, is probably something that could be worthy of another 20 to 30 minute uh, presentation on its own. I do, th I do think that um, uh, I, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot I can say about it, but I don't, I'm not sure what I can say concisely about it right now uh, on, on the subject. Uh, using virtual reality for evil might be possible. Uh, the, um, uh, it, it, it would have to be, you'd have to, it would have a very stealthy system. You'd have to it, 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 the, the person can't realize that they have a virtual reality uh, system above their head somehow. I imagine, unless the, um, un unless maybe they're um, or, or, or unless maybe it's like a propaganda training video in virtual reality could be used for evil. But that's that, you know. But that's um, uh, so the person knows they're in virtual reality, I guess. But it's just uh, but but they're, they're just training propaganda. Yeah, that, I mean, th things like that are possible. So uh, tra training soldiers in virtual reality, there one distinct advantage there, I think, uh, um, some, more mus some more types of muscle memory can be retained from that. I mean, you get, you get the best muscle memory from actually using weapons and field training and stuff like that, but for certain scenarios, maybe that are hard to replicate, virtual reality might be better than other substitutes for just for, for having experience that can actually get your muscles moving in certain ways to do certain things. Uh, all right. So uh, I think that's supposed to be all the time I had left. I my my timer. I kind of uh, wasn't.